Welcome to Mayo Clinic's ECG segment, Making Waves, continuing medical education podcast. Join us every other week for a lively discussion on the latest and greatest in the field of electrocardiography. We'll discuss some of the exciting and innovative work happening at Mayo Clinic and beyond with the most brilliant minds in the space and provide valuable insights that can be directly applied to your practice. Welcome to Mayo Clinic's ECG segment, Making Waves. We're so glad you could join us today. Today, we're gonna to discuss ECG interpretation and if the application of artificial intelligence may be helpful. We'll also be joined by a special guest that will help us better understand this topic and give us a look into the future. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce you to my co-host, Tara Gussie, who will become a common voice to you all. Tara is an instructor of healthcare administration and operations manager for the Department of Cardiology. She serves as the administrative leader of the Mayo Clinic Heart Rhythm and Physiological Monitoring Practice. And she helps lead a multidisciplinary team in the transformation and innovation of cardiac monitoring care. Tara also helps lead cardiac monitoring services throughout Mayo Clinic Enterprise and to expand the reach of cardiac monitoring solutions beyond the walls of Mayo Clinic. Tara, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. All right, well, I have the unique pleasure of introducing my colleague, Dr. Peter Noseworthy. Dr. Noseworthy is a professor of medicine and is a cardiac electrophysiologist. Dr. Noseworthy serves as the director of our heart rhythm and physiological monitoring across Mayo Clinic, where he leads a multidisciplinary team working to develop novel ECG software-based analysis tools. When Dr. Noseworthy isn't doing cases in the EP lab, he is leading our cardiac monitoring practice, developing new and novel AI technologies and transforming the delivery of ECG. Dr. Noseworthy, thank you for joining us today. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Great to be here. And thanks, Anthony, for the opportunity. Good luck with the podcast. Dr. Noseworthy, um, how did you get involved in the exciting line of ECGs? I think working with both you and Dr. Krishu, you are probably the world-renowned most passionate people about the field of ECG and just love to hear about how you ended up in this career field. Well, I've been interested in ECG since I was a medical student, really. And it was part of what drew me to cardiology, the idea that an electrical signal like this can inscribe so much valuable information about a patient. But, you know, the, the, the world of ECG has evolved enormously just in the past couple of years, and the team at Mayo Clinic has been driving that forward, and it's been enormously exciting, and I'm looking forward to talking about that today. And speaking about driving things forward, your team and yourself you know, recently published an inter interesting article on ECG interpretation using artificial intelligence. And really much of what we've seen in the field has really revolved around using AI to identify maybe a couple rhythms, often limited to one or a couple leads, but your work actually demonstrated the ability to get 66 discrete labels from various rhythms, conduction disturbances, ischemia, hypertrophy, and so forth from the standard 12 lead ECG. Now this is quite a leap from what we've seen. Can you share a little more about this work? Yeah, I'd love to. Well, if you think about what are the critical ingredients to apply AI to medicine, what you essentially need is a really large, valuable data set. And we've been sitting on this at the Mayo Clinic ECG lab. At Mayo Clinic, everything is centralized and archived and meticulously labeled. So we have the data at our fingertips. And then we've been using a, uh, a very advanced and sophisticated group of ECG technologists and cardiologists to meticulously label the ECGs over decades. So we have exactly the recipe that you need to apply AI to the ECG. What we essentially did was uh, taking all of the labels that the cardiologists and technologists apply to an ECG, trained a series of convolutional neural networks, which is a lot like the kind of software that's used or the kind of algorithms that are used for facial recognition. But instead of recognizing faces, we're recognizing subtle patterns on the ECG. And we can train a model using this to pick up all of the things that a cardiologist is trained to see on the ECG, and it works really very well. So the first study was simply just taking a list of those common co um, codes and trying to create individual algorithms to apply those codes to the ECG. We know that the current computerized ECG interpretation software is prone to error. And I think working here within our Gonda ECG practice, where our technicians read and review hundreds of ECGs a day, we know that there's incredible value in kind of that human intervention and having you know experts review all of our ECGs. 
How do you think that um, AI ECG interpretation holds up against current interpretation software that we use today in practice? Yeah, you know, if you go back a couple of decades or back to the 1980s, there was a lot of concern that the computers were going to take the job of the medical professional in interpreting ECGs. And that actually never happened because there seems to be a ceiling in terms of the performance of these uh, various algorithms in, in their ability to report an ECG in a clinically meaningful way. So even though the software is very helpful to clinicians and it might give a clinician who doesn't read a lot of ECGs, at least the minimum information that they're going to need, it's not enough. And you still need human oversight. That's using relatively outdated analog software. And nothing against that software, it was revolutionary when it came out, but we're in a vastly different landscape now in terms of computing power and uh, the ability, I think, to apply these kinds of technologies to the ECG. And I think we can improve it. I'm not certain we'll ever get away from human oversight altogether. I'm not even sure that we want to, but if we can avoid the errors that are introduced into the medical record by computer systems that aren't working well, or we can streamline our workflow, or we can reduce the cost or increase the efficiency and reproducibility of ECG interpretation, we'll serve our patients well. And I think that's the ultimate goal. You already got to my next question was like, how do you see this improving our clinical workflow, You know, providing benefit to our staff that are interpreting all the ECGs and you know providing value to clinicians. You know, I, I guess maybe you could give a little background about you know our ECG interpretation at Mayo Clinic and you know what that looks like. And I guess really as a, a clinician, I'm wondering how is this going to be helpful for me and the adoption of that into practice. Yeah. When I think about applying AI to the ECG, I think of two main goals. One goal is to do what a human can already do, but do it at scale and do it better and do it cheaper and do it with better reproducibility. The second is to see beyond human capability. And I suspect we'll have another conversation about that someday. But there's all kinds of things that these models can see that even a, even a trained cardiologist cannot. And in that situation, it's very clear the value that these technologies add to routine uh, ECG interpretation. Today, we're talking about the human-like capabilities, the reading the ECG and interpreting it in a meaningful way for clinical use. And I think if we can start with the existing analog software, get a running start for our technologists, overlay the AI to improve that and bring a little bit more subtlety to it, allow their job to be streamlined and more efficient, and also allow them to perform at the top of their training. We don't need them to tell us about a normal ECG, but we need them to pick out the things that might be missed by the computer. So if they can if they can add that piece of value, and then at the very end, the cardiologist can come in and add a little bit of uh, color or um, further detail to the, to, the, to the report, I think it could be enormously valuable. So we, I think we essentially at Mayo Clinic take a very layered approach where there's software followed by technologist overview, and then ultimately a cardiologist uh, who will sign off and make the final determination. And it's that iterative process that I think creates a very high value ECG interpretation. Now, do you see that kind of value extending to say, you know, resource limited regions that maybe don't have all, you know, the capabilities, the, the staff and everyone to help them with all their interpretation? Do you see a, a possibility in that realm or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, right now, we have over 130 ECG techs at Mayo Clinic, and we have about a dozen cardiologists who spend some time reading these ECGs. It's a basically an army dedicated to this task. And at, in doing that, we read over 300,000 ECGs per year. But if we could streamline our workflow even further, we could offer our services broadly across the Mayo Clinic Care Network, across all kinds of different potential customers. And I think if we can develop that expertise and streamline workflow and high quality, uh, it could be very valuable uh, to those, especially places that maybe don't have full-time cardiologists overreading them. What about overnight when uh, clinics may be understaffed? What about poorly resourced uh, places in the far reaches of uh, the US? There's all kinds of opportunities where I think we could uh, increase Mayo Clinic's reach and uh, help patients around the world. Now, an ECG lover, I mean, this stuff is so exciting to me. You know, Tara, I don't know what you feel about this, but I, I feel like these changes are going to be tremendous. And the field just gets exciting by the day. Is there anything you want to close or, you know, with Dr. Noseworthy while we have him here? 
You know, if I can just, you know, add on to that, I think that we've just got an amazing group of technicians that are seeing incredibly complex ECGs. And I think, you know, as Dr. Noseworthy alluded, we really have that ability to provide this broader level of care for clinicians, you know, that maybe don't have access to that same 24-7 level of criticality to review a complex ECG and be able to connect with the clinician to take relevant action. So just, you know, a huge kudos to, I think, all of our ECG interpretation technicians who go through in-depth training, are highly trained, are experts in the field, and it's really an incredible career just in and of itself. So um, excited to see how we can continue to kind of support all of our, our patients within the walls and outside of the walls of Mayo Clinic. Yeah, I would say they're, they're some of the best. Tara, thanks for mentioning them. You know, and I think the important takeaway from all of this is that, you know, Dr. Noseworthy, and just, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but you said that the AI would not replace the clinician, but likely serve as an adjunct. Was that correct? Because I think some of the concern is, you know, all this AI is going to replace what the doctor does and, you know, kind of put them out of business, essentially. Yeah, I don't think we'll ever replace human ECG interpretation. What we hope is that we can aid human interpretation and improve our quality and consistency and our ability to do this at scale. I think that's a very achievable task. I did mention that there are some things the AI can do that even a human cannot do. But once that's reported, it, it's up to a doctor or a clinician of some sort to take that information and translate it to some sort of meaningful action for our patients. And the machine will never do that. So uh, our, our job is becoming increasingly challenging, interesting, and nuanced, and the, the computer is helping us get there. How exciting. Well, we're standing at the edge of some of the most exciting work in the field of electrocardiography. It's clear that this 100-year-old diagnostic tool is not going anywhere, and its true potential is only beginning to emerge. Dr. Noseworthy, what exciting work you are involved in, and no better person to lead it. I want to thank you for your time today, and thank you, Tara, for joining me. It's been a true pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's been great. And Anthony, thanks for all the great work you're doing in the UCG space. Thank you for joining us today. We invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions about the podcast at cveducation.mayo.edu. Be sure to subscribe to a Mayo Clinic cardiovascular CME podcast on your favorite platform and tune in every other week to explore today's most pressing electrocardiography topics with your colleagues at Mayo Clinic.